on the 4th of August 2011. The officers from the Met shot and killed Mark Duggan, a 29-year-old mixed-race man in Tottenham in North London. Indeed, we're focusing on this story, uh, as you say, because it is uh, the week uh, ahead, uh, 10 years on. And following, obviously, Mark Duggan's death, London and many other parts of the country experienced four days of civil unrest, uh, which spreads to places like Manchester and Birmingham. We all remember this. Buildings damaged, shops looted, other uh, places, uh, businesses set on fire. The damage to property was valued at £40 million a day. Once police regained control, almost 4,000 people were arrested in the subsequent days and months. An initial Met Police report admitted that too few officers were sent on to London streets. Following the riots, the government and opposition set up the Independent Riots, Communities and Victims panel to explore the causes of the riots. Well, they found that a lack of confidence in the police response to the initial riots in London led to those further disturbances across England. The panel found there was no single cause for the riots, but it was uh, shocked at the collective pessimism, <clears throat> essentially, among young people that they had spoken to. In 2014, an inquest, inquest verdict said that Mark Duggan was lawfully killed. Mark's family lost a legal challenge in March 2017 when the Court of Appeal ruled that the verdict was lawful. Armed officers involved in the shooting were cleared of any wrongdoing by the police watchdog in 2015. That was following a three-and-a-half-year investigation. Well, as we look at this anniversary, uh, delighted to say we're joined in the studio by Ken Hines, who's a mediator and was a mediator between Mark Duggan's family and the Metro Police. He's the former chair of Haringey Stop and Search, Adrian Mills, um, who's a restaurant owner. And during the riots, uh, one of his restaurants was completely thrashed. And Peter Bexley is a former Scotland Yard detective. A very good morning to you all, gentlemen. Thank morning. you very much indeed for joining morning. us on the Great British Breakfast. Uh, Ken, let's start with you. Ten years ago, I remember that weekend. I remember that Saturday night, actually. Quite incredible that in, in the space of, what, 24 hours or so, the, the kind of mood in Tottenham and the, and the protests we'd seen around, around that death very quickly spreads elsewhere in the city. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I ha well, on the night it actually kicked off, um, I was called um, by the, the police in charge on the night to come down to see if I could help... Um, bring some sort of dialogue between the, uh, himself and the, and, the, and the family. I was successful in doing, doing just that. Um, but unfortunately, um, the person in charge wasn't really up to, the, up to the task, in my opinion. He made some bad decisions in the sense that he did not handle it as effectively as I would expect a police officer to do. And it resulted in a billion pound worth of um, damage and, and, and a number of deaths that occurred from it, which is very sad in that regard. And, and just, just talk us through, because you kind of, you know, we all remember that, but in many ways you were kind of on the front line uh, there. This, this was a set of riots, though, that wasn't clearly, you know, obviously it was Mark Duggan's death that kind of was the, was the spark, but it was much more about, as that report said, a sense of pessimism. And a sense of pessimism, I think in places like Tottenham in London, amongst kind of people there, particularly younger people? Uh, well, I think it was simply um, a cock-up by the ILPC. OK. Because what they said, there was a shootout between Mark Duggan and, and, the, and the police, which was never the case. And when they gave that sort of uh, misinformation, and already there have been several incidences leading up to that where there have been um, police... Um, use of force on, on other black, uh, black members of, the, of, of our community, um, it meant that this was another one to uh, cover up straight away. And to find that the IOPC, who was supposed to be independent, was also part of, the, um, part of this, it meant that it was just a step too far and, and the tension just overflowed. They knew all the time that there'd been a bad relationship between the police and young people. Um, but and the police chose not to do anything about bridging the gap with that kind of tension by using people, good officers or people like myself who are willing to step into the bridge and to absorb some of that tension and, and, lower, and lower, lower it for the better of all our, our communities. So just, 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 I'm just interested in this, though, just as in, 
obviously, as I say, that Mark thing was, but when we look at those images, those you know people burning buses and, and stuff like that, there were a lot of people who didn't know Mark Duggan, frankly, didn't really care about Mark Duggan, but still took part in the riots. What, why do you think that was? Was it just general dissatisfaction? It was almost a sense that they felt they had nothing to lose. Well, what it was, it's, it's primarily, the, the, I think the one common thread was around the, the use of stop and search or the okay. overuse of stop and search, mm -hmm. and specifically about Section 60. Section 60 is simply no suspicion. So what it means is that an incident could happen in a particular area and anyone in that particular area can be stopped and searched without reasonable cause. Also, so it's just the way that the stop and search was being done, the aggression that's being used on, on people who were compliant with the police uh, request to, to stop and search them, but yet find themselves being um, assaulted by thrown on the ground. Um, uh, one of the regular things that they do, and, and they still do now, is to put you in, in handcuffs, even though you're not being arrested and they want to have a dialogue, and they expect to have a civil conversation with people that they have abused. And, and I'm saying, if we can go down that line and not learn lessons, then we're going to and expect a different outcome. Einstein said, you've got to be mad, you know, because it's going to happen somewhere down the line. I'm, and I'm afraid that's where we're leading to. Mm. And we're going to be talking a lot more, you know, in this discussion about why people came out to write, because there were several uh, factors, weren't there? But Adrian, I want to come to you. Um, take us back to the 4th of August 2011, the, sh the shooting of Mark Duggan. Where were you? And you have several restaurants around those areas that, that, that the riots took place. Yes. When did it become apparent to you that this was going to overspill and become... We, we, the, probably the worst night of our business lives. We arrived home, we had a phone call from our manager because we had a restaurant in Northcott Road, which is Clapham Battersea Way, and he said, look, we're having to send all our customers home. He said, there's something happening, people are throwing bricks through windows, and Debenhams at the end of the road is on fire. And I thought, what? This must be an isolated incident. I remember putting the television on, and Ken Livingstone was talking, who was then the Mayor of London, and he said, there are some isolated incidents, this is related to what has happened in Tottenham, uh, but have no fear, everything is under control. Control. At that moment, I took probably the most chilling phone call I've ever taken, and that was from our manager and two waitresses who phoned from our restaurant in Ealing, and they said, we are trapped in the stockroom, terrified because there is a mob outside. I said, what do you mean a mob? A gang, what, 10, 12? Shit, there must be 100, possibly 200 people. Wow. Shit, they are smashing their way into the restaurant. They are kicking the windows in. They are throwing bricks through the windows. They're throwing the tables and chairs all over the restaurant. They're robbing the beer. They're taking the champagne. They're taking the wine. They're smashing the bottles everywhere. My waitress was then sobbing, not thinking she could possibly lose her life. Mm. And what people tend to forget is, and we talk about Mark Duggan, I don't know anything about, well, I, I know the story of, but I don't really know mm. everything that happened in Tottenham. Mm. You have to remember that at that moment in time, a pensioner in Ealing was viciously assaulted, fell to the ground, cracked his head, and while he's lying on the ground bleeding, people were going through his pockets, stealing his mobile phone, stealing his wallet. Subsequently, that particular gang then moved around Haven Green. So to just to say, we're just looking at the, these, this is Clapham. That, that, now, that that's is Clapham, Debenhams. That's Debenhams. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm just talking about. Yeah. Um, I suppose my kind of, I mean, I, as you say, you know, there were a lot of people who were using this just for an excuse of vandalism and for rioting and you know, for stealing, frankly. And, and, and Ken was saying, in many regards, a lot of people felt that because they felt that they were being victimised by the police. Mm. But then the report found, and I don't know how you feel about this, that the police in some ways didn't act enough in those early days, and that's why it was allowed to spread. Is that your sense? Or? I, I, it's totally my sense. I think the police were taken completely by surprise. Um, they had no idea that this was going to spread like wildfire across the whole country. Let's not just think it was just a London problem. Mm -hmm. um, but what the fear for me was that people... Uh, we phoned our electrician who lives nearby, and he said, I can't get to the area. He said, everything seems to be cordoned off. He said, but there are residents standing outside their houses, literally with pots and pans ready to defend their property. He said, because this is a baying mob. He said, these people are out for just sheer violence. And I got myself into a lot of trouble by actually being very outspoken that night and the day after by saying, I, I hear all about this, the things that happened uh, with the, the Duggan family and the, the police and the response and what possibly happened. But for me, there was absolutely no justification whatsoever in any shape or form. The people that smashed into our restaurant were wearing designer jackets, were wearing their top training, training shoes. 
And how stupid are these people? They then climbed out of the restaurant, holding all the booze, held it up to camera, and a couple of days later, what appeared on YouTube were all these idiots uh, set to music, and of course that probably helped the police in their inquiries, and most of them were picked up. Um, and to see people walking down the high street carrying 55-inch plasma screens on their shoulders and just laughing about it, but I just kept thinking, where are the police? Um, they were heavily outnumbered. The response, sadly, was greatly lacking. Um, and as a result, my waitress went back to Thailand a week later. She said, I don't want to be here. And in Thailand at the time, there were all these riots going on with the red shirts and the yellow shirts, and there was a military coup, and there were dozens of people being killed. She said, I feel safer in Bangkok than I do in Ealing. Mm. Uh, and Peter, what do we, what do we make of the, the police response? Um, as always, you know, the police get in some ways criticised that they're heavy-handed, get criticised that they don't react uh, enough. But they lost control, didn't they? And, and as you say, not just in London, across the country, there was a sense that it, like, there, was an there was pretty much anarchy, really. The police certainly did lose control. But if we just rewind a little bit to the shooting of, of Mark Duggan, yeah. um, Ken talks about the misinformation that the police were putting out there. There was also a lack of information and the way that they dealt with the, uh, the public relations, if I can call it that, mm -hmm. of Mark's shooting mm -hmm. was absolutely shameful. Mm -hmm. There was not enough information which created a void. And of course, when there's a void of information over something as emotive as a man of mixed race being shot dead in Tottenham, that void has to be filled. And that was filled with gossip and rumour and a lot of emotion. Mm -hmm. And that was part of the build-up as to why things turned out the way that they did. And of course, once the rioting had begun and was in full flow, the police response was woefully inadequate on many levels. Do we know why that was? What, why were the police? Yes, it was a lack of numbers in okay. many regards. There simply weren't sufficient officers on the street or enough officers that could be called in who were suitably trained and equipped at short notice to mobilise and kind of deal with this situation. And for some days, many members of the public, not only in London but throughout the UK, were saying, where are the police? Buildings are burning, where are the police? And, unfortunately, and shamefully, they simply weren't there in many, many areas. Mm. What actually happened with the shooting of Mark Duggan, people who are joining and perhaps aren't familiar with the story? So he was intercepted, wasn't he, with the belief that he was carrying a gun? Mark Duggan was in a taxi, and, and what is the undeniable truth is that Mark took possession of a gun. Mm. There is, of course, a lot of debate a lot of discussion and a lot of disagreement about what actually happened around his fatal shooting. Mm. I'm not going to fuel the rumours and the gossip and the emotion. That would be utterly irresponsible and disrespectful of me. But the, the clear, definitive truth of, of the matters um, is still subject to a lot of debate. There was, of course, an inquest, as we know, into Mark's death, and his shooting was found to be lawful, um, something which, again, remains a matter of some considerable debate, and certainly in the area where Ken lives, and he'll know far more about that than I. I, I was going to say, Ken, because uh, we're, what, ten years on, um, I, I don't know whether you're still in touch with the family or not. I mean, what's their sense of how those, you know, how things played out in the, in the days after his death? and how they may well feel 10 years on? Well, again, you know, each anniversary, um, Mark's death is, is, is kind of is acknowledged and, and certain events takes place. Um, so it's, it's coming up for the 10th anniversary and, and no doubt something will be happening um, um, early next week around this. But first of all, I'd just like to, to make a correction. I said the IL, I, ILPC, but at the time it was called the IPCC. Mm. Um, so this, just to clarify that. Um, and just to say quite clearly, you know, what was a very in, in sense that... Um, the, the black community still does is the simple fact that Mark had a blackberry in his hand and, and even when the police took the first shot that went through under his arm and went and hit his own colleague 
hit his own colleague that was standing there. Um, that should have been sufficient because he, he, he dropped the mobile, of course, he dropped the mobile phone. So if they, if they thought that, that that mobile phone, the Black Bee, was, was an actual gun, then, you know, that was disarming him. So why put the second bullet into him, which actually was fatal? So my thing is simply, you know, that's unexplained. And what's also unexplained, if he didn't have a gun in his hand or around him, how did they find a the gun some yards away? How did it get there? Now, quite clearly, there could have been a gun in the boot area of the taxi that was in, which could be accepted by the, by the community. And if the police put their hands up and said, we made a mistake, yeah, but we felt it was a gun and we shot him, and then that could have been un that maybe explained away. But what can't be explained away is a conspiracy. And since that's happened, the police have now subsequently been called um, an institutionalised corrupt. All right, and, and that is very worrying that we still got this trend going on, which means that all the good work that some police officers do, and, I've, and I've, I've, I've engaged with many good police officers, but a few bad apple has kind of murky the water uh, around this. Yeah. And Adrian, um, uh, just kind of wrapping up on, on you know, that the actual riots themselves, when you look back at them, uh, and I look back, and I think we all do, it just seems so alien. Mm -hmm. It seems like there was a kind of this weak, <coughs> almost weak, in which the country kind of went mad, <coughs> and then it stopped. And we all looked back and went, "God, that was mad." Yeah. But it was it was just a week of mad. It, it was a week of total and utter mayhem, where lots of people felt they could get away with things they wouldn't probably normally have done, because a lot of the people that were arrested subsequently that robbed our restaurant were in full time employment. One was an architect. One was a mm. supply teacher. One was, and it was I was like absolutely bamboozled by. Then we got the letters uh, saying, you know, I apologise, you know, I didn't mean to do this, I got caught up in the moment. But I tell you something, I have not really thought about that moment for all this time until today. However, during the Euros, we have a restaurant in Soho, the windows got smashed and trashed mm -hmm. by a baying mob that were in Leicester Square. And it was terrifying. And my manager said, I've never seen anything like it. And that brought back what had happened 10 years ago. And I hate to say this, the police response, the police were phoned numerous times, we're too busy to attend. We got an incident number where you claim on your insurance, but nobody has ever been to visit us. Yeah. And that was a reflection of what possibly could happen again.